Howdy tank watchers, Jack here for NSF with a post-flight Starship update for you. I can't believe I'm saying this, but yeah, it flew. It's gone. Of course, a lot had to go right for this to happen. So let's discuss everything that happened in the lead up to the flight. And we'll talk about the first flight of the world's most powerful rocket. Wait, if it lifted off with three engines already out, does that mean it was the most powerful rocket? Whatever, let's get right into it. The week began with the restacking of Ship 24 atop Booster 7, after both vehicles had their FTS, or Flight Termination Systems, installed. The FTS is placed on the common dome section of both vehicles and is used to, well, terminate the flight should the vehicle lose control. And as you can imagine, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Once the stack was completed, the anticipation and excitement was palpable as everybody knew the vehicle was finally ready for flight. In further preparation for the flight, SpaceX removed critical assets from the launch site. This includes the booster dance floor, which is a structure that is used to work below the booster on Raptor engines and other hardware. It was placed near the Starlink building. The first flight attempt was on Monday, April 17th, and it pains me to say that that day had exceptionally clear weather, great visibility, and clear skies. You don't get many days like that in Boca Chica. SpaceX managed to get through the count pretty quickly, but after initially targeting 7 a.m. local time, the T-0 slipped to after 8 a.m. However, they still managed to get to fueling of both stages and got close to T-0 before the issue that ultimately scrubbed the flight occurred. As a recap, the issue was a frozen valve, thanks to water having ingressed into one of the liquid oxygen pressurization lines. And with that, the booster was not able to reach flight pressure. All was not lost, though. SpaceX was able to use this opportunity to perform a wet dress rehearsal with the booster and scrub the launch to reschedule it for later in the week on, you guessed it, 420. I swear, sometimes I feel like I actually am living in a simulation. The vehicle was successfully detanked and the road was opened later in the day, so SpaceX could start the necessary repairs and modifications. Speaking of repairs and modifications, the dance floor I talked about earlier was moved back to the launch site so that they could work on the booster. Some of the work SpaceX apparently had planned, including additional checkouts and work on Booster 7's Raptor engines. So, the work platform was needed once again. Of course, a flight attempt does not mean they'll stop all the work in Starbase. Work continued throughout Starbase, including at the new building construction behind the Mega Bay at the site of the old scrapyard. We're still waiting to see what this construction becomes. Meanwhile, in the High Bay, Ship 27 and Ship 28 were worked on all week. This primarily involved more nuanced work that is not easily spotted, but it was obvious that there were a lot of workers present in the high bay during the times when the road was open. At the same time, teams performed work on basically every part of Booster 7's aft section. This includes its 33 Raptor engines. Here we can see why that dance floor I talked about is so helpful. The workers can get way closer to all the engines without having to worry about using a shaky aerial work platform. Monday's scrubbed launch meant something else as well. More fuel was needed. A lot more. And that's why we saw an armada of tanker trucks coming to the launch site, carrying both nitrogen, methane, and liquid oxygen. SpaceX is able to recover a fair amount of the propellant after a scrubbed flight attempt, but some of it inevitably boils off, and so it must be replenished after each attempt. I don't know about the veracity of this claim, but I've heard people say the amount of boil-off is greater than an entire Falcon 9's propellant load. And so that explains the large number of tanker trucks we saw in Starbase after the first attempt. Shifting gears a little bit, it does appear as though we'll see testing resume soon, despite significant damage to the orbital launch pad. How? Well, don't forget, SpaceX has the two suborbital launch pads where testing is done on engines and cryo tests. Well, formerly done on cryo tests. Now that takes place over at the Massey's test site, so pad A and pad B should be used for engine testing. As a reminder, Ship 26 got its Raptor engines a couple weeks back, and we expect it to be moved to the launch site for engine testing on either pad A or pad B. To prepare for the engine tests, the suborbital launch site received significant maintenance, including the removal of those thrust rams I mentioned, and new concrete on the protection berm. This berm protects the tank farm from being damaged during static fires. Remember, the force of 33 Raptor engines firing is such that anything that can go flying will go flying, sometimes at innocent minivans. These FOD walks, or foreign object debris walks, started a few days before the first attempt and continued right up until the second launch attempt. Entering crunch time on the day before the second attempt, SpaceX was still performing work on the booster quick disconnect 
and one of the hydraulic power units. It was a total nail biter, and some of us questioned if they would even complete this work in time for the flight. The TFR, that's the temporary flight restriction for the 20th, was even pulled, albeit briefly, before being reissued to allow for a flight on Thursday. Both work on the BQD and the HPU finished in time, so the path was then clear for a flight attempt on Elon's favorite day, 420. On the morning of the fateful day, SpaceX managed to stay on track right up until the very end, where they issued a brief hold to perform final launch checkouts. Visibility this time was not as great as it was on Monday, but while fog is annoying for spectators, it's no big deal for such a huge rocket. After the final checkouts had been completed, the rocket was go for launch. And, to the surprise of basically everyone, there was no abort at engine ignition, and it lifted off. The engines fired multiple seconds on the stand before increasing their thrust, showering the area in concrete, and pushing the vehicle clear of the pad in its valiant attempt to reach space. Remember, the perfect outcome of this flight would have been to reach a splashdown of the upper stage near Hawaii. However, both SpaceX and most spectators knew that this was an unlikely scenario, which in hindsight was the right expectation to have. The real win here is that stage zero, while damaged, is not completely toast from a pad fallback, so props to SpaceX for that. Starship flew all the way up to 39 kilometers, the highest of any Starship yet, losing several Raptor engines on the way. You can see the small puffs as each engine gives up. In fact, based on SpaceX's webcast, it seems like Starship lifted off with three engines out. I can't help but wonder if some of the flying debris we saw was the reason for this. It's a good thing that Starship got as far into flight as it did, and Stage Zero was spared any more damage than it was already subjected to. As flight continued, a noticeable loss of control occurred. It's still not fully clear why the vehicle lost control, but the rocket started to tumble and flip, and shortly after that, the flight termination system was triggered on both a booster and ship. This was done to protect spectators in populated areas, as you don't really want a huge steel tube getting close to places where people exist. The rocket exploded into pieces, leaving only a rain of steel parts to fall into the Gulf of Mexico. It does look like the HPUs, well, exploded on the way up, so maybe this loss of thrust vector control was to blame here. Thank goodness Booster 9 and beyond don't have these pesky HPUs and instead have an electrically actuated thrust vector control system. Suffice to say, we don't like hydraulics here. We want electrics. So Starship flew and exploded. But you might be asking, how's stage zero? How's the tank farm? Well, not great, but also not terrible. Some of the tanks took heavy hits from flying debris and the rocket managed to dig its own flame trench as it removed massive amounts of debris and concrete while throttling up. Elon on Twitter confirmed that future flights will include more mitigation measures to try and mitigate some of the power that probably damaged the GSE and rocket at liftoff. Lessons learned. As you probably saw, our own damage report includes our van, which was hit by a large chunk of concrete from the orbital launch pad at about 300 kilometers an hour, which in Freedom units is about 186 miles an hour. Add to that some shattered cameras, some busted lenses, but critically, some awesome imagery. Be sure to check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com for some metal prints of the launch. Critically, some of the profit from those metal prints goes to help support us photographers. So, if you want to help us out after what was basically a catastrophic event for our cameras, check it out. Grab a metal print or two, and we really appreciate it. A really great thing about the metal prints, aside from the awesome views they provide, is that the photographers that shot them get a share of the profit. So, if you want to help us out after what was a catastrophic event for our cameras, this is a great way to do so. Plus, the metal prints look really great since the images are printed directly on metal. They don't need a frame, so you don't have to fuss with that, and they already come with the mounting hardware you need to hang on your wall. So check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com. We'd really appreciate it. So, Starship finally flew. Hooray! It actually performed a multi-minute flight. It got past Max-Q, and it looked amazing. It was quite a spectacle, and we have several videos on our channel that bring you all the angles you want to see for a good recap of the flight. We'll keep our eyes and our cameras focused on Starbase so we can observe just how SpaceX will bounce back. I can't help but feel like there will be some major changes coming to the launch site, and maybe even to the next vehicles to be tested and flown, if it will indeed take them several months to rebuild, which all indications are that it will, I'm starting to wonder if Booster 9 and Ship 26 will indeed be the next ship and booster pair. Why not take this time to implement some of the design changes that have been building up as SpaceX has waited to fly the first flight? We'll just have to wait and see what happens as SpaceX attempts to rebuild after the first flight. But rest assured, we'll be watching closely. Alright, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and as always, be excellent to each other.